Part 1. Look at questions 1 to 4. Good evening, everyone. This evening, I'm going to continue last week's lecture by talking more about how people spend their money. First of all, I'm going to compare how people of different age groups spend their cash. You probably know that there's a lot of difference between what young people do with their money, how families spend their money, and what more mature people do. Secondly, I want us to think about what we imagine men and women spend their money on. And then I'm going to look at male and female spending patterns and see whether we were right. OK, to start with, let's divide the population into three sections. Let's say uh, young people up to the age of 30 in the first group. Then um, let's put families in the 30 to 55 year old group. So that puts adults over 55 in the mature group. Does that make sense? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Right, well, I found that the first group, that's young people up to the age of 30, mostly spend their money on clothes, music and entertainment. That's not really very surprising, is it? Although, I must admit, I thought they might spend a lot on cars and travelling around. So, the next group is what I've called families, people in the age group from 30 to 55. Naturally, as I expected, this group spends most of its money on food, toys and trips out. But I was surprised to find that people aged between 30 and 55 spend most of their money on furniture and kitchen equipment. I suppose it's logical if you think about it. People are usually improving their homes at that age and household equipment is very expensive. But they also spend a lot of money on electronic equipment like video games for the children. Now turning to the third group, that's people over 55. I thought they'd spend their money on gardening tools and electronic equipment, but I was wrong again. People in the over 55s group spend most money on new cars and days out. So, what did we think about how men and women spend their money? OK. Well, we thought that young women would spend a lot on clothes and shoes and that young men would buy more electronic equipment and cars. Well, when we look at the figures, we can see that we were right about the men. Young men spend twice as much as women on cars and computers. But, and this is interesting, we were wrong about the women. I was surprised to find that young women spend much more on beauty treatments than they do on clothes and shoes. So we'll have to think about that again. And there's another interesting fact about young women. It looks as though young women are much more concerned about their diet than men. We found that although young women don't spend as much as men on eating out, they do spend a lot more on organic foods than young men. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk about young people living on their own. Listen carefully and answer questions eleven to twelve. Loneliness is something we all suffer from in varying degrees, but young people living on their own can be particularly vulnerable. Many who leave the family home find they are less confident and have more difficulty in finding their feet than they expected. Often, going to work or study in another town or city will be the first time they have lived away from home. Although this may sound like an adventure for those dying to get away from the glare of the parental eye. For others, it is a daunting prospect, which generates apprehension, uncertainty, and even fear. In fact, in a recent survey of over sixteen hundred people who had recently left home, thirty-two percent said that understanding and coping with loneliness was a crucial issue for them and made them feel highly stressed and distracted. An annual report by researchers last year recorded a noticeable increase in the number of individuals with homesickness, transition, and isolation issues. Acknowledging that feelings of loneliness and isolation could impede progress at work or study, they examined the number of people using the welfare and health services. They found that young people, in particular, were prone to difficulties. Last year, 61% of all people using counselling services were aged under 30, and of this group, 57% were men. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at question 13 to 20. Leaving home involves a major change in lifestyle, work patterns, and degree of independence. You will be away from home, family, and friends, and are no longer supported by familiar surroundings. For this reason, in the first year, a lot of young people suffer from loneliness. Ironically, this sense of isolation comes at a time when you are likely to be surrounded by people most of the time. Living in a busy city, traveling on crowded buses and trains, you will be constantly among people. But this can sometimes compound your sense of being alone. Seeing others who appear at ease among large crowds, mingling and making friends, can make you feel excluded and inadequate. Adapting to a new environment makes people uncertain of what to do or how to behave, and breeds insecurities, which can make for a real sense of isolation. It is often those who are more used to being on their own who deal best with the transitional period of leaving home. Other reasons for feeling alone include high expectations of the big city, where you have the best time of your life and meet lifelong friends. It may be the first time you have had to make new friends since you started primary school, and perhaps you are reluctant, or finding it hard to replace old friends whom you miss. There are also pressures to juggle work and socialising, which may leave you feeling left out, or it could be that you have a long-distance relationship and feel torn between your new lifestyle and that special person who lives so far away. Because loneliness can leave you with a sense of low self-esteem, where you become self-conscious and feel you have been rejected, it is very difficult to overcome. You may be reluctant to even try and make new friends or take part in social activities, and will also find it difficult to say no to things, leaving you feeling exploited and weak. One of the ways of combating loneliness is to remember that it's not your fault. And that it's something everyone has to deal with, despite appearances.
Counsellors advise those feeling lonely to speak to someone they know about their feelings. They also ask them to consider joining groups and societies and to get involved in activities which interest them as a way of meeting more people. Of course, overdoing it and jamming your schedule with too many things just to avoid being alone will not work. But meeting others with common interests may be a step forward. If you still feel like you need someone to talk to, you could try group counselling, where you will be able to talk to and receive support from a small number of people with the same difficulties as you. For more information, or to be put in touch with an individual counsellor, contact the local town hall support services. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students talking about a class assignment about wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. OK, let's go over the requirements and see what we have left to do. Let's see. We have to give the professor a written summary of the information we've gathered on our topic, wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. The other written thing we have to turn in is a case study of the rehabilitation of one bird. We have the information on that already. Right. All we have to do is write it up. What about charts and graphs? Do we need to include something like that? I don't think so. They aren't really relevant, but we do have to turn in a list of the resources we used. Naturally. What about videos? I heard some of the other students were doing that. Well, I guess that must be optional, because I don't see it on the requirements list. OK, we should start planning our class presentation, since that counts for half the grade. We've looked at lots of sources of information. But I think our best source was the interviews we did with the wildlife rehabilitators. Agreed. That and the journal articles. I think we have enough information from those two sources for the presentation anyhow. The books we looked at weren't all that helpful. I wonder if we should try to bring in some live birds for the presentation. That would be too difficult, don't you think? But we have lots of photos of rehabilitated birds. We can show those. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Right. OK, I think we should start by talking about how to rescue a bird. Probably first we should help people understand which birds need rescuing. Yeah, that's really important. Because a lot of times people see a baby bird that's all alone, or they find a bird sitting on the ground and they think it needs to be rescued. And usually those are just baby birds learning to fly. So we should emphasize that people should only attempt to rescue a bird that's clearly injured. For certain kinds of birds, the rescuer needs to wear protective gloves because some of those birds have sharp claws and can tear your shirt or worse, injure your face or some other part of your body. Yes, that's an important point. 
OK, next, let's tell people to put the injured bird in a box, a box with good air circulation. We should let them know that a cage isn't necessary and a bag, especially a plastic one, could hurt the bird more. Another thing we need to say is that the best way to help the bird stay calm is not by petting it or talking to it, but by leaving it completely alone. Then people should take the bird to the bird rescue center as soon as possible. Right. And we should also point out that when they're driving the bird to the rescue center, it's better not to play music on the radio or talk loudly, because those things just stress the bird. Yes. It's better just to speak quietly while you have the bird in the car. OK, we've got that part covered. Next, we should talk about what happens at the rescue center. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a speaker giving a talk about some recent research about unusual life forms. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Hello everybody, and welcome to the sixth of our Ecology Evening Classes. Nice to see you all again. As you know from the programme, today I want to talk to you about some research that is pushing back the frontiers of the whole field of ecology. And this research is being carried out in the remoter regions of our planet, places where the environment is harsh and, until recently, it was thought that the conditions couldn't sustain life of any kind. But life forms are being found, and these have been grouped into what is now known as extremophiles. That is, organisms that can survive in the most extreme environments. And these discoveries may be setting a huge challenge for the scientists of the future, as you'll see in a minute. Now, the particular research I want to tell you about was carried out in Antarctica, one of the coldest and driest places on Earth. But a multinational team of researchers from the US, Canada and New Zealand recently discovered colonies of microbes in the soil there where no one thought it was possible. Interestingly enough, some of the colonies were identified as a type of fungus called Bouveria bassiana, a fungus that lives on insects. But where are the insects in these utterly empty regions of Antarctica? The researchers concluded that this was clear evidence that these colonies were certainly not new arrivals. They might have been there for centuries or even millennia, possibly even since the last ice age. Can you imagine their excitement? Now, some types of microbes had previously been found living just a few millimetres under the surface of rocks. Porous, Antarctic rocks. But this was the first time that living colonies had been found surviving um, relatively deeply in the soil itself. Several centimetres down, in fact. So, the big question is, how can these colonies survive there? Well, we know that the organisms living very near the rock's surface can still be warmed by the sun, so they can survive in their own microclimate. And this keeps them from freezing during the day. But this isn't the case for the colonies that are hidden under the soil. In their research paper, this team suggested 
that the very high amounts of salt in the soil might be the clue, because this is what is preventing essential water from freezing. The team found that the salt concentration increased the deeper down they went in the soil. But while they had expected the number of organisms to be fewer down there, they actually found the opposite. In soil that had as much as 3,000 parts of salt per million, relatively high numbers of microbes were present, which seems incredible. But the point is that at those levels of salt, the temperature could drop to minus 56 degrees before frost would cause any damage to the organisms. This relationship between microbes and salt, at temperatures way below the normal freezing point of water, is a really significant breakthrough. As you all know, life is dependent on the availability of water in liquid form, and the role of salt at very low temperatures could be the key to survival in these kinds of conditions. Now, the process at work here is called supercooling, and that's usually written as one word, but it isn't really understood as yet, so there's a lot more for researchers to work on. However, the fact that this process occurs naturally in Antarctica may suggest that it might occur in other places with similar conditions, including on our neighbouring planet, Mars. So, you can start to see the wider implications of this kind of research. In short, it appears to support the growing belief that extraterrestrial life might be able to survive the dry, cold conditions on other planets after all. Not only does this research produce evidence that life is possible there, it's also informing scientists of the locations where it might be found. So all of this might have great significance for future unmanned space missions. One specialist on Mars confirms the importance of... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.